is known to many of us. He is not only an activist, a good brother, he's a scholar. He's one of our scholars. And he's going to come up and share with you a piece, a speech, a spill, a history. He's one of you got to get out your pencil and paper and take notes. Want to bring to you to speak to the Honorable Marcus Garvey is Brother Paul Lee. Good afternoon, family. My name is Paul Lee. I'm the director of Best Efforts Incorporated, which is a professional research and consulting service that specializes in the recovery, preservation, and promotion of global black history and culture. I'm also an occasional historical features writer for the Michigan Citizen and the historian for the Shrines of the Black Madonna, the Pan-African Orthodox Church, which is why you see me wearing red and black. Um, I'm very grateful to Sister Shashu and my friend Njia Kai for giving me the opportunity to speak about Marcus Garvey on his birthday. I thought that Njia and I were close. She went to school with my brother Suni at Howard University. When she returned to Detroit, like most black nationalists in the city, I quickly developed a crush on her. As she began to have children, I fell for them one by one and was presumptuous enough to claim them as my own. Her children were so sweet that when they would see me, they would call me daddy. And her dear husband is patient enough not to slug me whenever I greet him and ask about our children. I thought that Ng and I were close until she arranged for me to speak behind someone as powerful and beautiful as Jessica Care Moore. So good night. I don't have much to say. I wanted to speak to you for only about five minutes about Marcus Garvey and his organization. But before I begin, I would like to ask everyone to hold your hands up. In a moment of silence, in the memory of Michael Brown Jr., who was slain by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And for all the Michael Brown Juniors, men and women across the country who suffer from racist violence. Thank you. I thought that I'd be able to launch into my brief remarks quickly until I noticed that John Conyers walked in. Congressman, can you please stand up? When I was in school at Howard University over 30 years ago, my brother, Sunni Muhammad Khalid, worked for Congressman Conyers, and one day I made the mistake of visiting Sunni at Congressman Conyers' office. The next thing I know, papers were being handed to me and orders dictated to me. After several months of this, I wondered, should I remind Congressman Conyers that I was not on salary? <laughs> Ever since then, whenever we've seen one another here in Detroit and Washington, D.C., the Congressman always seems to have something for me to do. So I must ask, Congressman, can I deliver my talk or do you have a job for me? <laughs> he said I could do both. And since you were kind enough to offer a respectful silence, in memory of Mike Brown Jr., I want to say that if you grow up in almost any city in America, but especially in urban environments, and you're an African American, and especially a young African American man, you are likely to be subject to racist violence, often by the police. If you or any member of your family has suffered or suffers anything like that, you need to call on Ron Scott. Ron, would you please stand up? It's your brother in the orange. He's been leading the campaign for years in Detroit against police brutality and other forms of racist violence. Um, I'd like to begin my talk by first offering some apologies. Yesterday when I asked if I could offer some brief remarks about Marcus Garvey, it only occurred to me after Sister Sashu and Njia agreed that I had perhaps bitten off more than I can chew. I've been an historian or a student of history since 1974, and I began studying Marcus Garvey that year after a friend took me to meet 
someone that the older black masses will remember, John Charles Zanthi. We knew him as Papa, Zanthi, Papa Zanthi. He had an import-export store on Woodward at McNichols. He served as Mr. Garvey's personal auditor. And I remember the first time I met him, he was a small man, but had a very vital energy, and I was intimidated by him, so I stood back and watched. And as he told stories about the magnitude of his late leader, I got chills up my spine. And ever since then, I've been a conscientious student of both Marcus Garvey and his movement. But I realized, after Gia granted me the opportunity to speak, that 40 years on, I do not believe that I am yet scholar enough to adequately characterize Mr. Garvey and his movement. Not in five minutes, I don't know if I can do it in five days or five months. And it put me, I put myself under a lot of stress and unfortunately ended up putting those around me under some pressure. So I'd like to apologize to my dear mother, Edith Lee, mom, my friend Sala and Aie up front, and my nephew, Juan Robinson. I've been a little short, and I'm sorry for that. To me, Marcus Garvey is the beginning of modern black history, and he's the center of the black universe. To those of you who don't know who Marcus Garvey is, I suggest that you go on the internet for biographical inter information. Instead of giving you a brief history of Mr. Garvey, I'd like to talk about his significance to black people worldwide. And by doing so, I brought some things that I'd like to read to you. For those of you who are not aware of his organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, it is the largest black rights or race uplift movement in the history of black people. No movement before, or so far as I know since, has as its aim to organize black people globally. By 1924, according to the Secretary General of the UNIA, there were 1,400 branches, chapters, and divisions, with 150 charters pending. By 1926, UNIA was in over 40 countries on five continents. And if you're interested in what the five, fifth continent was, it was Australia. Michigan was a thoroughly organized UNI state. There were branches, chapters, or divisions in Ann Arbor, Branch, Detroit, Flint, Halfway, Hamtramck, Idlewild, Jackson, Kalamazoo, Macomb, Macomb Garden, Muskegon, North Detroit, Pontiac, Quinn Road, which is just outside of Mount Clemens, River Rouge, and Ypsilanti. Now it's easy enough to praise someone who you're in sympathy with, so I thought the first thing that I would read to you is by someone who was not in sympathy with Mr. Garvey. In February of 1922, after Mr. Garvey was indicted on trumped up, on a trumped up federal mail fraud charge, the New York News, which is a black newspaper in Harlem, New York, offered the following assessment of the man, his philosophy, and their enduring impact on the black psyche around the world. Quote, Despite the personal attitude of Marcus Garvey and many of his misguided adherents, we are not among those who cannot see the misfortunes of Marcus Garvey are, in a sense, the misfortunes of the race. We have been unsparing in our criticism of many of the UNI's efforts because we knew that as true as the multiplication table, many of these projects were foredoomed to failure. But the Garvey movement has piled upon the other side of the ledger valuable race assets and achievements. Garvey has stimulated a greater practical racial solidarity and racial consciousness among the rank and file than they have ever known before. He has demonstrated the fact that black folk, the world over, can be organized and will organize for their own betterment. He has given them a greater interest and in knowledge of their own wonderful historic past. He has given them the self-confidence to attempt big things for themselves. He has stirred not only the West Indians and black Americans at home, but hundreds of thousands of black people in South America and Africa to raise pride in the conviction of their own potential equality. He cannot believe that all this can be wasted. The complete failure of Marcus Garvey's plans will shock that confidence, but it cannot destroy the awakened intelligence of the race. That was written by George W. Harris, one of Mr. Garvey's enemies. The most powerful black politician in the history of this country, before President Barack Obama and John Conyers, was one of Mr. Conyers' mentors, the Reverend Dr. Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. 
He was the pastor of the historic Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, which has the largest black Protestant congregation. And he was the most powerful black politician because he headed the, what was then known as the House uh, Education and Labor Committee. On the evening of August 1st, 1958, Dr. Powell was the last principal speaker at the annual Marcus Garvey Day rally held in Harlem. There, Dr. Powell made an extraordinary statement which electrified the audience. Marcus Garvey, Dr. Powell declared, was the greatest black man to live in this century, bar none, living or dead. Scholars, including some who are unsympathetic to Mr. Garvey, are increasingly lending credence to Dr. Powell's characterization. By the way, the only other speaker who drew applause that evening, greater than Dr. Powell's, was a charismatic local minister from an obscure black Islamic sect known as the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X. On July 27, 1966, Dr. Powell held a news conference on Capitol Hill to announce the first conference on black power. Black power being the new name for the very old tradition of black nationalism or black self-determination. Dr. Powell was joined at the news conference by a young Kwame Ture, then on the Stokely Carmichael, who was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, the civil rights organization that had called for black self-determination. Dr. Powell sought to educate both the young black power advocates and bewildered white reporters on the nature of the supposedly new phenomenon. The black revolution, Dr. Powell explained, began with Marcus Garvey. I mentioned Malcolm X to you earlier because two Malcolm X's parents were Fervin Garveyites, active in Omaha, Nebraska, and Milwaukee. And after they moved to Lansing, Michigan, uh, early little Malcolm X's father bigoted, visited the Detroit Division Number 125 over in Russell so often that many people thought he was a member of the Detroit Division. In an interview that Malcolm X gave with the Jamaican newspaper in June of 1964, he said the following. Many people think that Marcus Garvey died. He didn't die. It was Marcus Garvey's philosophy of Pan-Africanism that initiated the entire freedom movement that brought about the independence of the African nations. And had it not been for Marcus Garvey and the foundation that he laid, you would find no independent nations in the Caribbean today. So Marcus Garvey has not died. All of the freedom movement that has taken place right here in America today was initiated by the works and the teachings of Marcus Garvey. The entire black Muslim philosophy here in America is feeding upon the seeds that were planted by Marcus Garvey. I hate historians who attempt to speak for dead folks especially when dead folks left records that were speaking for themselves. So I'd like to end my brief remarks by quoting Mr. Garvey. It should give you an idea of how Mr. Garvey was able to inspire a worldwide movement. Mr. Garvey's international newspaper was called The Negro World, published in Harlem. In the July 11, 1920, in the July 11, 1925 edition, on the front page, Mr. Garvey wrote the following, trying to explain to his worldwide flock what his mission was. If I can inspire Negroes throughout the world, I would have done my duty in serving you and serving the Universal Negro Improvement Association. My duty is to assist the black man to find himself. My duty is to assist the black man to rediscover himself. But how timid some of us are in our feelings, in our actions, and our deeds because of this lack of consciousness of ourselves. Black man, do you not know that there is absolutely no difference between you and any other man in the world that God created, but the difference you yourselves have created in your own minds? Outside of the difference you have created in your minds, there is absolutely no difference between man and God's creation. The man who will place his ideals high and climb to them because it is possible is only different to the other man because the other man has no ideals and is climbing to none. And there shall be an eternal difference between them, so long as the minds of some men grovel at the bottom and the minds of other men soar above. Negroes, pick your minds off from the ground. You look down too much, and the time has come for you to look up. The time has come for you to face the world, face the world grim and serious, face the world even resolved to die, for the man who is not ready to die is not fit even to live. Let me inspire you Negro men to a sense of your responsibility, to a sense of your duty. 
God and nature and humanity call you at this hour to service, and none must say nay. Africa calls for us to service. And as white men have rendered service to Europe, as white men have rendered service to America, so the Universal Negro Improvement Association shall not cease this agitation, shall not cease this propaganda until it has brought 400 million black men, women, and children to render service to Africa. Now what service has the white man rendered that the black man cannot also render? It is only, I repeat, a difference of ideals. You black men of the world who will hang your ideals on the stars, you shall climb to them. Those of us who make up the Universal Negro Improvement Association have hitched our ideals to the stars, and we are going to climb to them. We are going to climb to them in the accomplishment of nation building, in the attainment of empire. We are going to register our presence here, and when our names are called and the pages of the Book of Life are turned, the Negro shall answer here. Not here as the disgusting and indolent servant with the one talent, but we shall answer here with an equitable development of the talent that was placed in our hands by the common distributor who gave each and every man, each and every race and group in this human family as talent to use and multiply. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. Back up. One of the things that we're doing this afternoon, reflections and connections, we want to recognize again and talk about and, and share with you the faces and the, and the stories of some of our elders who have direct connections to some of those faces that we may be more familiar with. And what I would like to do at this time is to give a tribute to Dr. Edith J. Lee, the mother of the brother, Paul Lee. That's my girlfriend. In tribute to our ancestors and in recognition of our elders, this certificate is awarded to Dr. Edith J. Lee in recognition of valuable contributions awarded at the 32nd Annual African World Festival on Sunday, August 17, 2014. Right. Thank you. Hey, Grandma. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Garvey movement, in 1920, he created a national flag for black people everywhere with the tricolors red, black, and green. Red for the blood that we shed to redeem Africa, black for the color of our people, and green for the burdened lands of Africa. And that's why, as a member of the Shrine of the Black Madonna, I wear the, rack, the black and the red. When I told my mother about it, she put on black <laughs> and got the red, close as she could to red, to honor Mr. Garvey. <laughs> my mother doesn't want to say anything, but I'd like to add something about her and my dad. It's a common statement that we stand on the shoulders of giants as a people. Well, I stand on the shoulders of the two giants that I call my parents. My mother, Edith Lee, and my father, Dr. C. Bruce Lee. I'm sad my dad can't be here because nothing that I've done or will ever do would be possible without mom and dad. My father is a lay historian he doesn't have a degree. Actually, I don't either. But my father has something that I lack. He has what I call a grasp of the poetry of history. When he tells stories of the past, it's almost frightening because you get a sense that he was there. And I've been intimidated by my father's intellect my entire life, but I'm grateful that I got at least some of his genes because it makes my work a lot easier. All of my older brothers are quite handsome, and I've told my mom that she apparently gave the leftovers to me. But I'm glad to get just a little piece of them because what I got from my parents was a great memory, I'm a quick study, and I also had the unstinted support of my mom and my dad and what I did. They didn't necessarily agree with the things that I was attracted to, but they always respected my decision to pursue what moved me, and they backed me up. 
When I first told my father that I was interested in Marcus Garvey, to my surprise, he recalled that as a young boy in Buffalo, New York, he used to watch the parades that Division Number 79 used to put on. I only learned recently that the Liberty Hall headquarters of Division Number 79 was on the same street as my dad, Washington Street. So while I'm sorry that my father can't be here in person today, I trust that he's in spirit. <laughs> in spirit. I'd like to say thank you, Dad. <laughs> Thanks, Mom.